Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Today we're having a bit of an online fiesta. We were together this morning for the coffee chat and now I have the amazing Rosemary McCallum right next to me. She's come over to my house. Good morning, everyone, and a big thanks to Nat. Yes, my pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, interesting whenever I do uh, guest webinars, it's always the other person's at the other side of the computer and we're kind of co uh, coordinating things from both ends. But now we're right next to each other, so it's really, really cool. Rosemary is an amazing woman, as I've said in um, in some of the, um, obviously, promotion of this particular call, uh, and we finally derived how I could describe her because for years I've known her and I haven't been able to say to people, this is who she is, this is what she does. I just have to say to people, you just have to experience her to really know uh, what she stands for. And finally, the other day when we, she was part of my marketing masterclass, we, you know, she told us she's changed 2,000 lives as well as um I say, uh, you know, Rob, who was there with us, he said, you know what, Rosemary, I think you're a bit of a female version of Wayne Dyer. Uh, and mixed in with Tony Robbins because she's not all about uh, being, let's say, super fluffy, but she's got the hardcore metaphysical stats and um, reasons why we create or why we self-sabotage our behaviours. So as promised, guys, we um, we are really going to talk about the unseen obstructions that can sink your business success here, and and she will really delve deeper. So take note, we are recording this call because I think you'll need to listen to it two or three times because Rosemary has never delivered the same talk twice, and I'm here with my notes um, at hand. Make sure that if you do have questions or comments that you are actually uh, bringing those up and um, and asking in the questions box. We will stop from time to time to, to handle those and we'll allow plenty of time at the end to listen. So just before we get started, can you guys make sure, can I get a few highs coming through in the question box to make sure you can hear us and you can see the PowerPoint presentation that we're showing you. Um, there's all good from Karen. Thank you very much. Hey, Tara. Nice to see you and um, Joe, all good from there. Hey, from Melbourne, Susie, all good. Felicia, thanks, Felicia. Savitri, great to see you on the call as well, Di. Um, and uh, bonjour to Vanessa. Awesome. Well, I'll let Rosemary um, hand it across to her, let her deliver her gold, and um, I, um, I will jump on and I'll be listening as well as you guys and jump on at the end to actually um, have more of an interaction and ask my inquisitive questions. Take it away, Rosemary. Thanks, Nat. And look, I appreciate that you're taking time out of your very busy day out there because we're all working hard, wanting to be difference makers and make a difference in our own life as well as in the lives of others because otherwise we wouldn't be in business. But one of the things that I see all the time, and I know there's a whole lot of metaphysical supposed stuff out there, including the secret, and unfortunately the secret is not the secret. It's just part of it. And I want to share with you today how on a vibrational level or on your vibes, you're not actually attracting what you want due to some certain, certain things and how we can sort of go to a new part of our brain. It's modern science has caught up with the fact that, of what's called brain plasticity. And brain plasticity is going to a place in your brain where you've never had a belief system before. And they've started working on stroke victims and others that they thought the brain was fixed. So if you had a, a stroke or a, an acquired brain injury, that was it for you. But they finally discovered that's not quite true. So we're just going to move you out of your old brain and into your new brain, if you would be happy to do that. So let's have a look at how the process works, and then we'll have a look at why it's not working in some cases. Yep, <laughs> here we go. Technical, we'll go that way. Poor Nat, she's dealing with a Luddite here who will <laughs> press buttons, wrong ones. So... Whatever we put attention on and then pay attention to, we will take action from. So if you think about to get to this webinar, you actually had to move somewhere, sit down and prepare your time. In that process, you probably used a thousand intentions, but they're so automatic. They're what we call um, cellular memory now. Your body actually has a memory of how to do things. So it's become a subconscious action. 
then you're paying attention to that action and doing it. So at that moment, you were making a conscious responding action to what you wanted to do. But our problem is most of what we're going to do when we have to step outside of a comfort zone and building a business, as you, I'm sure you would agree, is really about stepping outside of comfort zones. And in that case, it brings up a very, very interesting phenomena. And that phenomena used to be called what they called stimulus and response. And in the old days, they called uh, Pavlov's dogs, bell rang, dog salivated. They did that by putting food down, but first they rang a bowl, and the dog learned if the bell rang, it would salivate and then the food would come. Now, we do the same thing when we have actions that have been repeated over and over and over again. And there's always a stimulus, and I call that stimulus, when it's in a reaction phase, I call that a brawl. Now, that's the BS rules that you're telling yourself, rules that would have been instilled in your mind in between being in the womb and between the first five to seven years of life. Wow, for some of us, including me, that's an extremely long time ago. So a brawl is something that might be set up in a family. It can be you've got to work hard or, you know, um, for in my generations, why get a career because you're only going to get married and have kids. They were brawls that we, we were subjected to. Another brawl, which my mother used to give to me, God bless her, was, you know, if you don't have a, no, a really beautiful figure, no one is going to go to want to desire you. So that became a brawl that dogged me for years in my mind because I always felt I wasn't good enough from that. School can ignite a million brawls because you are you are judged based on an ability which may not be one of your major talents, yet that's the very thing that says you're not good enough. And we have hundreds of these things. The next problem is, though, that when we start to pay attention to this, when it pops up in our head and we get this sicky feeling or the lump in the throat or we get a little bit frozen like a rabbit in the headlight, in comes what I call the next one and what you pay the most attention to. This is where the problem really gets a little bit of a fire up and I call that the cruels and that's the critical rules, the critical rules that are going on in your head in response to the rule. Oh, I'm never going to be good enough. Oh, I'm not as clever as that. Oh, I could never do that sort of thing. Oh, you know, maybe I'm just not meant to have this business. I hear it all the time when people come. Or they'll go, is this really my purpose? I'm going to have a little talk about purpose. Is this the path I'm meant to be going down? All of these disquieting thoughts that come up in us. And then what we do is sabotaging action. We actually play out that criticism. Now, I'm sure every single one of you out there at some time has tried to give up something, whether it be you were a smoker, maybe you're drinking a little bit more than you thought, or you're on that awful thing that I call diet. Because if you're on a diet, you're dying inside. So, and we go really well for about two weeks. And then all of a sudden something happens and we're standing at the fridge and we're now over at the couch eating out of the ice cream and we didn't even know the, how we got there. That's what we call reacting to a situation. So once we start to do that, we then start to bring up a few more little interesting things and we move to actions, feelings in the present. But we can only act and feel based on what our mind is telling us. Now, it's feelings that are creating the problem. The feeling is a thought and an emotion coming together, which is in the body and is felt in the body. Now, in that present moment, you've put yourself on what we call a lower vibration. So if you've brought up, you know, oh, this is never going to happen to me, what happens is the universe is going to mirror back to you people, places, times and events to not only support that belief system but also to challenge it. 
It's not playing some sort of weird game. This is about if I wanted to listen to 3AW on the radio and I had my dial on 3MP, have a think about how long it would take for me sitting there to actually hear 3AW. It's never going to happen because I haven't got my radio frequency specific to the channel and frequency which 3MP is actually broadcasting on. So when we're moving with feelings that deplete our energy, we're on the wrong broadcast for any success at all that we would like to have. So there is a lot going on in our head. And I know in business, the first thing you go is the how and the what. And unfortunately, that's a long way, that's a wrong way around. Because every time you get a new how, you're creating this fantastic little reaction in your mind because you're going, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And in that process, you're actually defeating yourself. So it looks a little bit like this. This is how it looks for us. Here we are. We're up in the scene. So we get caught up in the nitty-gritty of our business. And we forget why we don't, we're there in the first place. Have a think about the enthusiasm and the passion that you had when you first started your business. You had all these wonderful goals and all the rest of it. And even if you thought you were going to make a lot of money, you're not in business to make a lot of money. You're in business to do the things that money provides for you. You're never there just to make a lot of money. And we get caught up in thinking, oh, I've got to make this amount of money. No, it's more about this amount of money is a vehicle for the things that I desire in life. So the scene part focuses on the top of the water. We all know how huge icebergs underneath. So that's your conscious mind, that top of the water there. And this immediately starts to bring up these limiting thinking because you're starting to go, how am I going to do that? It's a logical process. It's how what we would call marketing, policing, process. And this is actually a mission statement. And the problem is people write that before they, re they write their vision statement. Because to have a vision is to give yourself a pathway for where you want to go. We've just come back from a retreat where we looked at all the allegories and metaphors in Alice in Wonderland. And, you know, as Alice comes out of the wood and meets the Cheshire cat and she says, please, Puss, tell me which way I should go. And he says, well, that depends on where you want to go. And she says, well, I want to go somewhere. I don't want to go over there with the mad people. And the cat said, well, we're all mad here. But I'm sure if you just keep walking long enough, you will get somewhere. And that's what we do when we don't build a business and we get caught down in the how. And then we go to that waterline of emotions. What, what do I need to do for a sustaining um, competitive edge? I've got to do more, got to do more, got to do more. And you become that little hamster in the wheel, running, 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 working ridiculous hours and not knowing why you're doing this in the first place. So what happens is your ego, and there is nothing wrong with ego. Ego is a really important thing. You wouldn't get out of bed with ego without ego. But what I know about ego is that ego serves your dominant thought. And if your dominant thought is I'm a dropkick and I'm never going to be any good at anything, that's what ego is going to serve and it'll keep bringing you back to that. And we call that action precedes thought. That's when you take an action without even thinking it through. What just happened? What are the consequences if I'm going that way? What am I learning here? And this is really important for us. So the values that we give, we say, oh, we've got all these values and I have these values in my business. But values are what you give your most predominant thought to. It means you value it. So if your most predominant thought here in this unseen world is I'm not enough, then that's what you're valuing. And that's really scary because you just keep creating I'm not enough. So. Here's our brules. Brules is also mimetic thinking. It gets a little deeper here because mimetic thinking is cellular belief. So sometimes we take on the beliefs of our parents from three generations back. 
So, you know, um, for some great immigrants that come out here in first generation and they do work hard, they work incredibly hard. But, you know, that's their ethic because they have to. They've got nothing. And then the next generation is a little bit indulged by them and but they still have this ethic, got to work hard, got to work hard. And then the third generation comes along and says, I've got to work hard and I've got no idea where I'm going. Because the the first generation had a huge vision, a better life. But the rest of them are all running on, I've got to work hard, and they're and just losing energy all over the place. So our cruels, our subconscious belief-based thinking, it starts thought waves going up. And then we're going to put some emotion in on top of it, and that's going to strengthen the wave. And people, places, times and events come into your life to show you what you're valuing. And then, of course, our actions, our sabotaging actions, there's things, that, there's things we need to do within our businesses and we, we procrastinate. Procrastination is one of the best ways to know that there's a brawl, crawl and sprawl happening in your life. It's, it's there every time. So every time we desire, if we come down here in the why in the unseen, Every time we desire something, because we haven't built a big enough why, it has to go that in that to that habitual thinking, inside the box thinking. I'm sure you've all heard of that. And the in the box thinking is just a neural net that you've set up and it keeps firing and wiring and firing and wiring and the rut is getting deeper and deeper. So the stimulus is our desires. You all want to have this amazing business and the world needs you to have this amazing business. But the drivers and the needs of who you really are are not being supported. You're just running wild with your eyes shut because you're in the dark about who you are and why you're really doing this. What is my purpose? And it's always there. So if you've got any questions about that, I'm really happy to answer anything as we go along, just pop those questions up. Yeah. Just um, as they're coming up, uh, guys, do uh, post them up because we'll stop and actually answer them. So when they're ready rather than us waiting for you uh, to type them up now, then we can often go and answer. So that was that was really insightful. Um, I was trying to think about my own uh, background and how my mum looked for a better life to bring us over here in Australia and uh, but I actually had deep ingrained beliefs that you've got to work hard to make lots of money because I witnessed her working three jobs while I was growing up in Macedonia and then um, when I started my own business it was almost like uh, mirroring her uh, her work ethic if you like. Absolutely yeah. because that that's the environment that you were nurtured in that mm. you know and hey a great work ethic is fantastic mm. but killing yourself in the process is not so mm. good you mm. know so so this is where we start to. Um, so we've got Kip here so how do we make a bigger why to get rid of procrastination uh, what questions do I need to ask myself? Okay, Kip, we're going to go on with this and start to show you that how to actually do this. What I had to do was bring you to the point of understanding where we are in our life, and we've all got them, as Natasha just showed you. It's a fantastic um, thing about it. My mother instilled in me, um, she was a woman before her time and her mother was a woman before her time. Mm. Uh, her mother uh, was thrown out of the house in um, the 1800s because girls in the Irish tradition in those days didn't inherit. And so when her pa died, she was given £10 by her brothers, the boys got everything in those days, and sent off, bye, out into the world. You know, she was 16 years old. So the first thing she did, being a good Irish girl, she went and bought a plank and two barrels and a tent and she set up her first pub on the gold fields. Mm -hmm. So she's an amazing woman because she'd come from immigrant, immigrant parents who'd worked hard. So she saw that you could, she also had a good business sense. Now, when my mother came along, my mother had this wonderful business sense inside her, but she was a 1950s wife. And in those days, you stayed at home and reared the family and she was already always, always terribly frustrated by that. She died a millionaire in, uh, by um, in buying and selling houses, but she always felt that she could have been so much better and whatnot. So she used to say to me, 
playing out her unfulfilled need, she used to say, you better marry someone rich because you're never going to amount to anything. Now, she was mirroring back to me her own unhappiness and dysfunction for life. But I'm a young child and I'm taking on those beliefs. And when I went to start my business, that played havoc with me. I I went through um, the fraud syndrome, which a lot of people will go through. And I'm talking 35 years ago that I was doing this. And the fraud syndrome is, well, what if I'm not good enough? And and what if people find out I don't know as much as they think I know? And then, oh, my God. And so we're talking ourselves out of it. I know that syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, and, and I reckon everybody that starts out now goes through the fraud syndrome. At least for the first two years. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know in my own self what I, how I um, work with my clients now, I say, Tell me about what you do and tell me blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know more than me about that. So therefore, in my eyes, you're an expert. You're always Mm -hmm. going to know more than the audience that you're going through. And I said, as you gain your confidence, more of that knowledge will come out. Because whenever you go to anything, always say to people, you've got like a coffee pot on the top of your head and you're not going to get it all. But if you just let that coffee pot filter through and you start to get rid of all of this, that's when all of that will come into your mind and you'll be speaking it out and you go, gosh, I didn't even know I remembered that. So let's have a look at what, what's next in here. But we must be aware of this is what we're doing. And, Kit, I think we're going to answer this question as we're yeah, going through it. It is, Kit. Yeah, I said that, that we will mm. answer it. So let's have a look at what, what happens here. These are roles that we took on in childhood. Now, between the ages, again, of 0 until 15, you can't think contrary to the fact. So you start to absorb these things in. And a child needs to get attention from a parent. That is the number one paramount thing that a child wants. It needs to know that it's validated and valued. And let's face it, guys, our parents didn't have this um, rule book that came along. No. You know, they just worked hard, didn't they, Matt? To, yeah. They were in survival mode. My parents had survived two wars. You know, they were just surviving. They didn't understand. No one gave us a blasted um, book to raise children or be in a relationship. But what happens is as we get told we're not okay, and I'm going to use me because I know me, so I'm born a sanguine choleric child, which means I'm loud, messy, and bossy. (laughs) My mum is 98% melancholy, which means her whole life is about perfection. Everything has to be perfect. To top it off, she was in the military, so it had to even be more perfect. And then she was a a well-respected tailor and everything was just schmick when she did it. So along comes her loud, bossy, change of life, irritating child. And my sister, who's a lot older than me, she's also like my mum. She could wear a white dress for four days and not get dirty. I'd have it on three minutes and the the horse would sneeze on it or the dog would jump on it or I would find beetroot somewhere in the world. And it started to mess up that, my personality wasn't very pleasing to my mum. And because I needed her approval, I started to adjust it. And the first one that I became was what was known as the lost child. I didn't know who I was. So I used to daydream all the time about who I was. And I just became a bit of a loner and retreated back into myself. And then I found I wasn't getting any any energy from that. So I became the carer. Most counsellors out there have this one, I have to say. So the carer, you know, everybody else's needs more important than yours. By the time I was 25, if someone said, what do you want? I had no idea what I wanted. But if I knew what you wanted, my life was complete. So I didn't know how to even set a vision in place because as far as I was concerned, if I wasn't caring for something, I didn't matter. And to matter means to be present in the world. And then I got way sick of that by the time I was 15 when I could think contrary to the fact, and then I just went into a ridiculous rebel. So these are part here on on this chart, and this is just a minor amount of them, of the roles that we'll take on through childhood that can be still with us 50, 60 years later. I am sure all of you have seen at some stage someone go into tantrum and you go, oh, for goodness sake, stop carrying on like a two-year-old. Well, That's their two-year-old presenting Mm. themselves. 
So it, through all of this, we start to set up these beliefs and, and patternings. And the first thing to go out the window is fun. Really think about it, guys. When was the last time you approached everything from the point of fun? From the point of Alice in Curiouser and Curiouser. That, that fun that we put into life and that delight of seeing what's going to come next. Remember what it was like waiting for Christmas and what was in those presents under the tree? There was almost a, a gnawing need to undo it, but at the same time that wonderful thrill of waiting to find out what that surprise is. And with Christmas coming up, we've got that wonderful film, um, The Polar Express, which I'm sure will be regurgitated over and over again. But it's worth watching because in that is when you, hear, when you can no longer hear the bell, you can no longer have Christmas. And we forgot to have Christmas in our life because we grew up and got old. So when we're trapped in a role, the only possible stimulus is reaction. Carers will go, look, will go looking for victims. Victims will go looking for carers. That's how it works. And no, neither of them will actually grow because there's a dynamic going on here. I need you to validate that I live and I need you to validate that I live. And we have to think about what we're using and where we're doing it. And unfortunately, the result of that is regret shame and guilt and these you know they say on people's deathbeds the greatest thing they have is regret and you know if you get to the end of the journey you want to go out going wow it was a wonderful ride emotions are really important for us and we what we do is we we um we say they're good and they're bad there's no such thing as a good and bad emotion there is just an emotion if you have what you're deeming as a bad emotion, that's just telling you, hey, you've got some thoughts there that aren't worth having. If you've got a highly good emotion, that's just saying, yeah, okay, but focus back on the path because the path is actually neutral. It has no feeling. I'm sure, Nat, you have days when you get into flow. Yeah. And, you know, and you look up and the clock and you go, heavens, where's the mm. day gone? And there's no thought, no feeling. Mm. That's called flow. And that's your creative stance because when you're judging good as against bad, if you go, oh, I did better than I did yesterday, your judgment's going back to how bad you were yesterday. Mm. Really difficult to get to, but when we get there, it's absolutely fantastic. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the secret. I think yes. they've all been waiting for the that, secret, you the know, how. the how-to. The first thing is an intention, but a conscious intention not running on automatic pilot. So you've created a why, you have a vision. Your first vision is you've got a business. So who do you want to be in the situation of the business? This is something you need to actually sit down and write it out. We had our group do, we call star work. It's very involved. It's, it's hours and hours of work, but it soon sorts everything out, I can tell you. And the first thing is who do I want to be? Because the reason that you are doing anything is to be. That's why we're called human beings. It validates who we are. So as in being is in a situation, do I want to be empowered? Do I want to be gracious? Do I want to be gentle or do I want to be firm depending on the situation? Do I want to impassion other people to follow me or do I want to give people the skills to find their own way? They are all ways of how you want to be in a situation. And you know what? When people keep going, what is my purpose? That's your purpose, is to be choosing who you want to be in any given situation. So you sit down and you start to write, who do I want to be in my business? It's not about what do I want to have because if, as soon as you go, I want to have something, you're now in lack. So you're putting out to the universe you want to have some more lack. Yeah. Universe doesn't think literally nor emotionally. It gives you your focus. There is no man up there with a big packet of presents throwing down things to you. You are creating your world based on universal power. You can call that universal power, you can call it God, you can call it frequency, you can call it vibrational energy, you can call it anything you like. But at the end of the day, 
your thoughts, which is vibrational energy, is triggering onto vibrational levels and creating your life. And it's in the power of being that you really create. Then you sit down and you go, how will I act physically? Now, when I did this for the star work, because I'll never ask my gang to do anything unless I do it first, um, I went through, because I'm moving, expanding my power now to go into keynote speaking internationally, and what I'm doing there, I put down a whole day of how my day would run from the moment I get up to the moment I come home at the end of that speech at the end of the day. And I listed every single action that I would take. Now, a lot of people say, why would I need to do that? The reason being is your brain needs a picture. It doesn't think in words. It thinks in pictures. When you have a memory, you don't have a memory in words. You have a memory in a picture. So the more pictures you can present your brain of how you're going to be, how you would walk, how you would stand, how you would talk, how you would interact, how you would be when you get off the stage, how you would interact with people coming up, how you would hold your attention with them. The more you're giving your brain a pathway of neural nets to run along to create a cemented neural net. It's really, really important to present a picture. And, you know, years ago when I first did the star work, I think I had about four things on there. I had 49 things about how I'd be. And now what I'm going to do is cement that into my mind. I'm going to read it every single day until it becomes second nature. I'm sure there's plenty of that you, you out there that learnt to drive a manual car, and I'm sure you can remember what it was like. The, did you learn to drive a manual yep. car? Yep. You remember that? Yep. Bunny hops. Lots right, right, of right. thinking. Uh, <laughs> lots of thinking. Lots of changing gears, lots of crunching gears, your parents having heart attacks next year. I, used to, I went grey teaching my kids, um, uh, you know, handbrake starts on hills. Yeah. And, oh, my God, it was terrible. But eventually they were driving and you were driving and you didn't even notice you changed gears. Wow. So the conscious shift is from reactive, which is where the body is driving the mind, which is what you're doing when you're driving a manual car, to creative. Every time you have a thought that is conscious and you start to set this process, you're dropping down the quantum field. Observed energy creates matter. You've been observing in a reactive way and creating matter from that. Now you've got to you have to go in a responsive way. So, second intention. How do you want to feel? That's an F word for you guys. There's oh, yeah. a four-letter F word to, for you. The cause of your unhappiness isn't the situation, but your thoughts are surrounding it. Choosing your feelings create response. This is where the magic really starts to happen because feelings create frequency. So we've got a thought, we're putting an emotion with it, now we're creating a feeling. So how will I feel when I move, walk into that room? Yes, I will have butterflies in my stomach, but I will feel excited. I will feel that I'm contributing. The best way to create the right feeling is to start with the first feeling. So let's say I was going to say I'm going to feel excited. And then I would ask myself, and when I feel excited, how does that make me feel? And that makes me feel enthused. And when I'm enthused, how does that make me feel? It makes me feel dynamic. And when I'm dynamic, how does that make me feel? That makes me feel centred. And when I feel centred, how does that make me feel? It makes me feel powerful. Always chase your feelings down five times. You will get to the duck's guts of what that feeling is. I intend to be powerful. Now, when I'm intending to be powerful, that means I'm tuned in, turned on, connected to my true authentic self. It's not overriding someone with power. When I'm tuned in, and this is why I say to, to Nat, one of my big, um, my big hurdles for me is that when I give a speech, I go in with a topic and I just connect and let 
the people who are in that audience hear what they need to hear. But in keynote speaking, they want you to do a memorized oh, yeah. speech. So never going to happen. But that's okay. So remember, choosing your feelings create, a, uh, create the response. The third intention is the desired internal outcome. So we have start, inner, outcome. How do you want to feel as you walk away from the situation? Maybe the speech didn't go so well for me and that could bring up all sorts of rules and cruels and all sorts of things. But the first thing I'm going to set down what went well, what may I have improved on, and let's look at the gold in what I might improve on. We're so judgmental instead of saying, wow, all right, I will never make that mistake again because I'm going to learn from it. It's absolute goal. When I was, um, when I did, um, got qualifications, corporate stress um, associate, I read the word environment, I think about 70 times in the essay and spelt it wrong 70 times. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got it back. With, oh, really fantastic, blah, 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 but all these big red crosses through <laughs> environment. <Yeah. laughs> now, that brought up an old inner child thing where I'd been shamed at school because I'm dyslexic and I'd written a P back to front and it looked like a nine and I had to go to preppies and ask them what it was because I was too stupid to know. <laughs> God bless. So you think I can spell environment now? Damn right I can. <laughs> you know, so, so choose that before the situation happens and you step it out of being a reactor and you become a creator. If there's any artists out there, every time you paint a painting, there is always a sense of, well, maybe I could have done more. But that purely opens you up to more. Mm. When you try to be perfect, that means I've got to stay in a contained certain little way and how can I become greater if I'm going to hold in that contained certain way? We're meant to make mistakes, guys. And, and think of it like a movie thing, a mistake. Yeah. You know, they don't cancel the movie. Yeah. And that's sometimes they're the, the biggest ones. So our purpose now is to move from reactor to creator. And that's the three simple steps now. There yeah. really is nothing more to it. It doesn't have to be years of study or anything else. It's just being aware. Yeah. I say the same thing to my authors, you know. Uh, if you did it again, you'd do it a bit differently. So don't be too precious on adjusting and changing your content all of the time. I just say uh, let it go. It is what it's meant to be right now. If you wrote this book again in a year, it'll be different. Every book I've written, if I wrote it two, two months down the track, it'll be different. And it'll become a saga because exactly. you'll be adding more and more and more yeah. in. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, uh, at the weekend, you know, they had to be in groups and they had to give feedback. And some people were giving these oratories and I said to them, you lost the value of the feedback in the mm -hmm. amount of words that you gave. Mm. sometimes first is best, isn't it? Yes. Because it's succinct and it's less mm. and you get to what I call a duck's gut so much quicker mm. in doing that. So um, questions here, guys? Have a look here. So we've got uh, <laughs> Vanessa's just said um, my favourite movie to watch with the boys. Was it Polar Express? Yeah, Polar yeah, Express. That's on your homework yeah. list. Um, okay, Kit says, there are so many lists uh, that we need to create and read every day. How do we prioritise the many lists? <laughs> okay. Good question, Kit, because we get lots and lots of information about what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. The only list you know you need to make is who do I want to be. Who do I want to be? Yeah. You yeah. need to know what your personal needs are. What are your personal needs? For me, you know, I have a high recognition need, which was really interesting because only recognition I ever got was for being a dropkick. So when people said, you know, gave me recognition, I actually pulled back from it. I found it very difficult to take a compliment and everything. But after I become comfortable with the fact that I, need, I only need to recognise me. Yeah. You know, so I started to work through my number one need is recognition and I started to work through that. How can I recognise my sense of satisfaction through what I do? Mm. That's that's what it's about. It's not getting recognition from other people who haven't walked your path. They have no right to recognise you for that. Mm. So I hope that helps you a little bit, Kit. 
That's your first need. The next one is just these three things. How am I going to do it? How will I be physically? How how will I be mentally, physically and emotional in that moment? And that's all you need to do. Yeah. And also another thing I've heard you say in the past is like by just by creating that picture through our mind because I've heard you say like we don't um, – uh, our brain doesn't know if we've had the experience for real or we haven't. That's absolutely perfect. You know, your brain, you can present a picture. If you if you all had amnesia and I told you tomorrow you were Bill Gates, even if you were a girl, and I could present a whole lot of pictures of yeah. you as Bill Gates, you know, being yeah. a girl and all that sort of thing, and you had this empire, the most amazing thing that would happen is you could step into that job. Now, that's yeah. a big call, mm. but I learned that when I was young. And my parents were were incredible theatre goers. Mm -hmm. And we went to see this um, hypnotist. And in those days they were sideshows, you know, they weren't people getting down to the depths that hypnotists get now. Anyway, my dad says, oh, it's all cooked, it's all rubbish, blah, 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 Mr Cynic. And um, my auntie got dragged out. And Mm -hmm. my dad's like, hang on a minute, did they make that up for her? you know, to, to do it. And up on the stage and hypnotises and he told her she was Chopin. Mm-hmm. And and he asked her to play one of Chopin's music pieces and she played it and she had never in her life played the piano. Wow. So that shows you the power of your mind. If you watch the film Lucy, fantastic movie, as to why we're only spending 10% of our brain in creating is because we're human doings. Not human beings. A brilliant movie for that. Absolutely. Is that a new one movie? Yeah, it was out last year. Yeah, I think I've seen it. Yeah. And then she gets access to her whole brain. Yeah, to her whole yeah. brain and yeah. it disappears. Remembers yeah, yeah, remembers the whole experience of when her parents had yeah. her everything. everything that happened yeah. in her whole life. Absolutely, mm. you know, these incredible they just became normal to her. And if you notice it, she become completely unemotional. Yes. So for us, fortunate emotions are very nece- necessary for humans mm-hmm. is to keep us on track because if we became um, totally unemotional, we would just kill, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, without any thought or yeah. reason. Yeah. So so we do need part of our brain not access. Tara says, it. reminds me of the series John Doe. Uh, I, was this um, about the creation, Tara? No. He could put himself into a space. He could do any profession at all. Oh, okay. Well, I've never seen that. There is also Limitless, which is now a series. Actually, yeah, me and Stuart have been watching Limitless uh, lately. He, he takes a pill and uh, gets access to his whole yeah, brain and all absolutely. that sort of stuff. So I, I, I totally believe that. I mean, you know, some people um, – uh, it's like how they pigeonhole us sometimes in school. Like who oh, are the, school's the worst. Who yeah. are the smart yeah. kids and who yeah. are the not so smart yeah. kids? Yeah. So you know, it's what identity. I guess what I'm getting out of this is what identity are you going to create for yourself uh, that's going to fulfil your deepest needs? Exactly right. And if we break the word up, identity, yes. it's id entity. Yeah. Okay, and the id is the belief system that we have around ourselves. It's yeah. our constructed story of yeah. who we are rather than – so we're identifying with that story, which yeah. is a rule, and yeah. then that story comes with a whole list of criticisms and then we take action on that. Mm. So we just change our id. Mm. That's all it is. And everybody makes it so damn difficult and it's mm. really not difficult at all. Mm. You know, it just takes a little bit. Of, you've got to fake it till you make it, just yeah. like you've got up there and sold your business and you're feeling fraud syndrome but you're still doing it yeah. until it until it becomes one with you. Mm. And one of the things you can do to do that is to create what I call an empowerment board, not a vision board. You do that for your, vision, your business. Yeah. But an empowerment board and looking at and putting your strengths up in that board and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. and you have it there and you remind yourself every single day, this is just a portion of who I am. Why am I believing the limited thoughts that are in my head? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Another very simple way, guys, if I can add some value Please from do. a yeah. different mentor um, you know, you guys have heard me talk about Terry Hawkins who wrote the book uh, There Are Two Times in Life, Now and Too Late, and she put it very simply in the in a sequence of see it, say it, feel it, do it. So this yeah. is similar. Yeah. Just, Rosemary yeah. is explaining it in so, slightly different terms with how she teaches it, but that's exactly what you said. Yeah. You see it, you say it. So I guess the say it uh, is you externalise. Obviously, you need to hear yourself. You take more ownership in what you want to do. You feel it. 
which yeah. was your step number two. And then you, you know, obviously then you're doing actually automatically yeah. eventuates. <clears throat> the only way to cement it, you can see it and feel it, but the only way to cement it, and I'm sure that you've been yeah. done it a million times with all your fantastic clients, is you have to take action. Yeah. yeah. Because you've got to give your mind an experience of it. Yes. And the more experience you give your brain, the more it goes, oh, yes, I have a memory of that. I'll do that. Even though we can fool our brain, the more we can give it sustainable memories and the experience of it, it then becomes in the cells, yes. just like changing the gears in the car, yeah. and we go out and do it. So you, you start to do that in your networking meetings. Great way for practising. Yeah, and I think the reason I uh, a lot of people have heard me, like I have very much liked writing and my goals and writing stuff and using a written planner and all this sort of stuff, and I think because it's very intentional and very action-focused Absolutely. rather than, say, typing it up on a computer. So I think that those two steps when we said see it, say it, even that's intentional, say yeah. it. Saying yeah. and externalising things is intentional, doing, writing, um, they're all intentional actions. And writing is very powerful, guys, as in the old way, writing. Yes, yes. <laughs> because writing, not typing, for some reason because you're against another frequency, yes. it's not the same. But when you're handwriting, you take the energy from your higher self and take it down on your arm and put it on paper. And once it's on paper, you know this is where the, sword is, uh, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Once it's on paper, it's an actual fact for you by yes. taking that energy and taking the action of writing it. Mm. You can even, look, if you feel you're not a good writer, you can draw it. Yeah, then, oh, even better. Yeah, <laughs> drawing is fantastic because it's all a create creative expression. Yeah. Communication is in a million things. You come and tell me that you're this genius and you've got your arms folded, I'm just kind of going, sure, I'm really not believing that. You know, how you communicate with your body, this is why, mm -hmm. how am I going to be Physically, is Physically, importantly, yeah. mm -hmm. is how my community. You, you walk on stage and you're slumped over, and you, you know, I'm going to go, wow, you know, this person's really yeah. connected to what they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just absolutely true what you're saying there, Nat. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. All the intentions and things like that. And what you always talk about the deeper, uh, how do we tap into this? Uh, or our desires is by working out what need we're fulfilling. It is needs right? everything, and that's that's the only way to do that. And look, I I just especially to do this for you, for you guys. I did it last year when we did. Um, yeah, I did this, guys. I I, I was breastfeed. I was my baby. Was. My baby was like six weeks old, and I didn't want to miss this day with Rosemary, which is power power, power up your purpose and prosper which is all about uh, discovering the deep need, what is the ultimate need that we're trying to fulfil. Is that That's exactly more? right, Doug. You see, you notice on the bottom of that, um, on the bottom of the, um, the iceberg was your needs, your needs and wants. If we don't know what our needs are that are driving us, if we don't know whether what drives us is challenge, lifestyle or family, then we're just not going anywhere. We're just, again, working hard. Yeah. So what we do is we, we look at to become, to be who we are, our sole purpose on earth is to meet our needs. End of story. Yeah. We don't do anything unless it meets a need. Mm. But when, we dis when we're detached from the need, we just keep doing and doing and doing. And, and it's like... Um, I've had some clients that have got lots and lots of money and they keep going, I've got to make more money, I've got to make more money. And I, and I said to them, why do you have to do that? Oh, I've got to have a lot of money in the bank. Why? I don't know. Because money makes me secure. And I said, but there's no security in money. Absolutely not. We went from owning our house to owning nothing with the stroke of a pen by a court case that we had to bring against a client who defaulted in paying he had no money. We got left with $290,000 worth of court costs in the 80s and we were paying 27.5% interest mm. per month on that. So we had to sell everything to wipe out the debt. Mm. So all that we had just went in the flash of a pen. But what I did have was the security in myself that, okay, I can start again. Same thing I think mean, ultimately um, uh, when you arrive at a point when you know what you need to do to turn things around, that is where it makes me feel most secure. Whenever, Say if I have my business slows down a little bit, uh, I know what I have stopped doing yep. 
and I know what I need to start doing to regenerate the same kind of momentum. So I think it's the certainty and security in knowing that you've got yourself. Exactly it's not so right. much uh, I've got this much money in the bank because you can generate money, it's just energy. That's exactly right. You know, it's an exchange of energy for your energy. Yep. That's yep. all it ever is. And if you've got no energy that you're putting out there and wanting to serve people and help them, of course money's not going to follow. And Perfect. then if you do put the uh, – and I always say, you know, if you work and you're – your, your heart is in the right place, you will be rewarded um, in the right sense. So um, I think the energy then, then flows back to you. Yeah, so tell us about this the day. I mean, I attended it exactly at this time last year. Yeah, well, you, yeah. Do you always run this one last year? In again? January. Yeah, run always it in, gen, it's a, it's in January gen. to get the year set up properly for them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because we're going into the silly season now and yes. it's – it is a silly season. So we do run it in January. It's at the Quest, Doncaster, yeah. uh, just waiting for them to confirm the date. But it will be that date. If it's not the Quest, it will be somewhere close. close. It's, no, it's no big deal. We, we won't be moving the date. So in, in coming to that, we first thing we get you to do is um, a personality need profile mm -hmm. because that needs to be explained as it goes along. It's not a piece of paper that you can send to people because most people do it out of those roles. You've got a carer and they're going to tick every little carer box. So we explain that for you so we set your path. The other things is that we're going to help you create intention in attention and action based on that, yeah. based on meeting that need. Once you – oh, that should have said 16. <laughs> Typo. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we start to create a roadmap for you. We start to say, all right, how can you act? How can you do this? What what more can you do from that? It's a full day. It's a little full on. You work really hard. We get you in a little hot seat. Um, we have uh, we work out what your driver is. Now, I had people come in. They said, oh, my family's my driver. And I said, well, most people do say that if they yeah. have a family. Yeah. And I said, but it's not about that. It's a, the driver of family is where do you need to work? And I learned that from Maggie, my daughter's friend, who's a manager at McDonald's. And she went and did a, um, a, a, de a degree in justice, mm -hmm. you know, so she'd be out there being a lawyer or whatever she wants to be. But I said, well, why you, how come you're still at McDonald's? She said, because that's my family. Mm -hmm. And I love working in that environment. Yeah. And see, for me, that's the total opposite. I'm a, I'm a, a challenge. Give me a challenge. I might kick and buck and have a tantrum about it, but once I feel strong about the challenge, I'm off and running. And I'm not really a group person worker. I, I mean, I don't work well in that way, which tends to makes me called as a control freak. But it's mm. just the way I work. You know, mm. um, yeah. I can't be bothered waiting for people to get back to me. Whereas my husband, he's lifestyle driven. Yeah. So if I want something done, I don't say, oh, this is a bit of challenge we've got to get through. I go, if we can get through this, we can go on a holiday. Yeah. And he's like there 24-7 working mm. away at it. But if it's a challenge, mm. he can't – He his personality doesn't work that way. It doesn't he meet down. it. Yeah, well, he needs security. Yeah. You know, and mm. uh, because of his – he has a C personality, which is a high security need. Mm. But it also says that they'll work 24-7 as long as they know that it's becoming a purpose for them. Mm. So understanding that is really, really important. And then what we do is when we get a need, the problem is people have values and most of them are just rubbish now, mm. you know. It's like they're platitudes. You go to every company and they go, oh, we value integrity, and they're probably the most – yeah, non integrity co <laughs> yeah. you know, um, spilling oil out in the in the sea or something. It's about what is the, how you work a value is is all right. This is my need, so maybe my need is is contribution. Mm -hmm. A value is a is a is a high way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Our thinking belongs to our um, values. Our needs belong to our physicality, and because we're human. We need to support our physicality, else we won't be here. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take three values mm -hmm. off our value list and we create a policy and procedure about it. Mm. Well, how am I going to act out that value? Mm. How am I going to feel in that value? Yeah. And how will I respond if I'm challenged by that value? You know? And that way you're starting to get really strong and really strengthened in the process of it. Mm. And, and from that, that creates your map. That yeah. tells you exactly, and you never let it go. You yeah. never 
let your value go. Fantastic book out there. I recommend it all the time. The Leader Who Has No Value. <laughs> has no no. Values. That doesn't sound really good. The Leader Who Has No Title by Robin Sharma. He wrote The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And he yeah. gives different um, sections about people of all works of li- walks of life working their values and how they're peaceful and contented. And the one that appeals to me the most is The Maid in the New York Hotel. She is just amazing because when you're living your value, your attitude mm-hmm. is spot on. And that's and that's what we want to help you with, guys. Let's get rid of all the fluffy values mm-hmm. that are out there and get really, really clear on what, what really is my value. Yeah. My top three, knowledge, courage, and determination. Never shift from them. Yeah. Yeah. So. I love it. And my – well, I um, – talked about my values being fast, fun and fame. Which are fantastic. Um, yeah. yeah. And I love I love them because they uh, everything that I do and I attract and I create is around those three. Yeah. And um yeah, I I love this day. It, it that makes you think a little bit deeper. It's not about we're not creating here a um a business strategy if you like, but in a way it is yeah. because it's your personality that's gonna drive what is going to be um you know, then creating the rest of the year. Uh, there's a comment, uh, how many at this session, how many do you normally take in? Rosemary? Oh, probably only 25. We only do yeah, about 25. Last year, yeah, yeah, I think we yeah, did about 20. 20-ish. Yeah, 20-ish. yeah. I'll yeah. cut it off that because I want to be able to give you that mm. individual attention. Yeah, know. we were sort of sitting in a U-shape yeah, part of, yeah. of set up yeah. in the smaller of the two rooms yeah. in the uh, Quest. And, yeah, it was really it, it was yeah. really good. It makes you think, like you just uh, – you know, we don't normally go to, say, seminars or events such as these, um, which we should do a mixture of because I think working on, to get to know ourselves a lot better. And I know Rosemary does amazing work, work on uh, inner child. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, a lot of metaphysical kind of. You've only really touched on her tip of the uh, tip of the iceberg or bottom. You know, wherever we want to look yeah. at it. Yeah, 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 it's amazing. I have posted this link for this workshop, guys, in the chat box. So you, sh- you should be able to automatically click through and you can secure a spot. And Rosemary obviously will let you know, uh, and, you know, send your confirmation and things like that to make sure that you have got. Um, yeah, uh, I'll send you what to bring, everything, yeah. you know. Um, we shouldn't be changing venues, but she was waiting for someone to get back to me. Yeah. It'll, it, yeah. it'll be in that close proximity of that because it's sort yeah. of. Good as parking, you said, fantastic yeah. parking there. Uh, really easy to get to. I mean, we use it. Probably a lot of the people on the call have already been there. Are there any last questions? We're almost on time. Um, okay, cool. I won't. Um, yeah. So yeah. So anyway, um, we. Um, I have found this to be very insightful. Every time I hear it, I think I hear a different distinction, Rosemary. Mm-hmm. I I think that's always uh, always the way with you. Um, and actually, another thing, you guys, at the same venue next Thursday on the 26th, uh, you can see Rosemary live from 6.30 to 9.30, which is run the UBS live event. Uh, that one is $25. It's our Christmas theme. Yes, Rosemary's mm-hmm. been uh, – this is her third year in a row that she's delivering a talk for our community, always the November events, her event. Um, and uh, we uh, support TLC for Kids through the sales uh, of the tickets there. Uh, but also, um, uh, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, the, it slipped my mind. <laughs> it would have been wonderful. No. It will be. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> will be a, a wonderful night. Actually, that's what I was going to say. This was Rosemary's very first webinar. Uh, yes. Wasn't it? And, oh, yes. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> it, you know, I think you did an amazing oh, job. Thank you. Uh, you know, even though starting to run a webinar or running one is a bit awkward, kind of you're talking to a computer screen, but, you you know, this lady in real life is um, a powerhouse as well. Like, you know, I mean, obviously the experience face-to-face yeah. is so much so yeah. much more different and, and stuff, so I encourage you to come along. The other thing I want to say is TLC is one of the most amazing people and they don't get much of support out mm. there. So it's mm. really great that those funds are going to there. I work with street kids and all sorts of things for years, you know, mm. and um, we all need a bit of TLC. But, yeah. but more importantly, if you give yourself TLC, yeah, you'll become very profitable in all areas of your life. 
I, I agree. And now a lot of thank yous are coming through. Lucy said thank you. She had to go and get her daughter from school. Uh, the link um, is it's in the chat box, guys, that I have posted. I can't post it in the question box, but I will anyway send out a copy of the recording and I might put that link inside that um, email that will follow up with the with the recording. So just um, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and Tara, I'll give you a call. And the link, ah, oh, the link for the 26th. I might be able to get that for you guys. Um, hang on a second. Uh, where is it? Oh, I ran a webinar earlier today that actually had that. So I'm just going to get it for you. Coffee. It was in the coffee chat this morning. Here we go. Uh, Melbourne. Here we go. I'll post that copy and paste. Here we go. Oh, there we go. All right, so I've sent through those two links uh, for the course. You're welcome. And have an amazing go uh, day, guys. I hope this has been really valuable. Re-listen to the recording. Pick up different insights as I always do. And we'll chat to you soon. Bye.